Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. In this video, we're taking a look at calcium and phosphate homeostasis. We're going to have a look at how calcium is absorbed in the body, where it's stored along with phosphate, and also how we maintain levels of calcium and phosphate using two very important hormones. One, parathyroid hormone, and two, vitamin D. Let's take a look. All right, to begin, let's talk a little bit about calcium and phosphate and their various roles within the body. So firstly, calcium. Why do we need calcium? Calcium is extremely important when it comes to muscle contraction. And this muscle contraction includes all types of muscle, whether it's smooth muscle, whether it's cardiac muscle, and whether it's skeletal muscle, calcium is involved. When calcium jumps into these muscle cells, those muscle cells will contract, very important. It's also really important for nerve conduction and nerve signaling. So in order for a neuron to send a signal and speak to another neuron, it needs calcium. Calcium helps release neurotransmitters and can also stimulate neurons to send signals. Calcium is also really important for a process known as exocytosis. This is the release of various chemicals and hormones from cells of the body. And finally, calcium is really important when it comes to bone strength in regards to mineralization. It makes bone strong and it does it along with phosphate. So let's talk about phosphate. One of the roles of phosphate, I'm always dropping pens, one of the roles of phosphate, again, is bone mineralization. So along with calcium, both calcium and phosphate will be deposited within bone, and it forms something called hydroxyapatite. I'll talk about that in a sec. What else does phosphate do? Well, phosphate's really important. It makes up, it's part of, it's a component of many different structures of the body. So for example, phosphate is really important because it makes up phospholipids. And we know phospholipids are the membranes of our cells. It makes up ATP, adenosine triphosphate, so the energy currency of the body. It makes up nucleic acids, which we know comprise DNA. So it's a really important structural uh, molecule within phospholipids, ATP, and DNA. All right, so a couple of other points. Calcium. The total calcium within the body is going to be spread in the extracellular fluid, so outside the cells like the blood plasma, the intracellular fluid inside of cells itself and also organelles and bone. So if we have a look, we'll find that for calcium, 0.1% of calcium is in the extracellular fluid, while 1% is sitting inside cells and organelles and around about 99% of our calcium is stored within bone. Let's compare this to phosphate. For phosphate, around about 85% of phosphate is sitting within the bone, with around about 14% within the cells of our body, and around about 1% in the extracellular fluid. Importantly, phosphate levels within these structures are quite variable. Calcium is not. Phosphate levels, let's just say in the plasma, can change three times their normal amount before any problems sort of arise. But calcium, this is not the case. If it's just tweaked a little bit, that can lead to a whole range of problems. And the reason is this, because if you change calcium levels too much, it's gonna alter the way muscles contract and nerves conduct. You might say, but phosphate's involved in ATP and DNA. Yes, but remember, ATP levels change significantly throughout the day, producing and using, for example. So the fluctuations are relatively normal. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. When we have a look at calcium, it's uh, stored in three, not stored, it's um, available in three different ways, right? So three types of calcium is available. First, you've got calcium, that's, I'm just gonna write because we know it's about calcium. We've got calcium bound to proteins. We've got calcium bound to anions. Hmm, what are anions? They're negatively charged substances. So this includes bicarbonate, 
bicarbonate, phosphate, and citrate are the most common anions that uh, calcium is bound to. And then you've got free calcium in the form of its ionized form, ionized form. So if you were to calculate these, right, the free calcium is around about 50% of all available calcium. That's really important. Bound to proteins, it's around about 41%. And bound to anions, it's around about 9%. All right. So importantly, most of our calcium is available as free calcium that's ionized. And that means it's available to move in and out of capillaries. So for exchange, really, really important. Now, when we have a look at phosphate, what about its availability? Well, have a look here. Phosphate is either going to be part of molecules here, right? Which calcium really isn't or mineralized within the bone. So the calcium and the phosphate come together. You're going to have calcium and you're going to have phosphate. I'm just going to write it like this and you'll see why in a sec. I'm not going to write the molecule for it. And when it comes together, it forms something called hydroxyapatite. Hydroxyapatite. Now hydroxyapatite is the mineralized form. It makes bone hard. Without collagen, the bone will be brittle. So calcium and phosphate make bone hard. And then adding the collagen makes it not just hard, but resistant as well. Now, so you've got phosphate in uh, bone as hydroxyapatite. So is calcium, right? You've got phospholip bound within phospholipids, ATP and DNA, but you've also got, like you've got your free calcium, the ionized form, you've got your free phosphate. Now, what we call this is PI. That stands for inorganic, inorganic phosphate, inorganic phosphate. You might think, well, what's the organic phosphate? This is phosphate in the organic form. Now you might think phosphate can't be in an, in an organic form. It's bound to organic molecules. What does that mean? It means they contain carbon, right? Phospholipids, ATP, DNA, they all contain carbon. And if phosphate's bound to it, that's phosphate bound to organic molecules. The free phosphate is the inorganic phosphate. And you sometimes see it written as the I. And there's two main types, just like we've got three types here. There's two main types two types of inorganic phosphate. You've got HPO4, two negative, which we call um, uh, hydrogen phosphate or monohydrogen phosphate. Nearly forgot then, monohydrogen phosphate. And you can have H2PO4 negative, which we call dihydrogen dihydrogen, dihydrogen phosphate. All right. Now, importantly, one of the functions of, of monohydrogen phosphate is to act as a buffer. So I told you some of the functions of here. One function of the inorganic phosphate is to act as a buffer. So for example, if you've got hydrogen phosphate floating through the cells or tissues of your body and it comes into contact, with a hydrogen ion, they can bind together to form dihydrogen phosphate. H2, because there's two hydrogens now, PO4, and instead of the negative, it's balanced out there, so it's a single negative, so it's dihydrogen phosphate. So that's really important. One of the roles is to work as a buffer. So maybe I can add that as well. Works as a buffer. All right. So we've gone through some of the important functions and quantities of both calcium and phosphate within our body. Let's talk about absorption. How is, and we're going to focus on calcium, right? Because generally speaking, I said calcium levels 
fluctuate only a little bit. If it fluctuates too much, you've got a problem. Phosphate though, it fluctuates heaps. So it's not necessarily a big issue. However, when we control calcium levels, we will simultaneously control phosphate. Why? Because most of them are bound together in bone. So when we need to increase calcium levels, for example, we're also going to be effectively releasing phosphate into the bloodstream. We'll talk about that in a sec. So let's talk about absorption. What we've got here is the lumen of our intestines. Now you might think, what is the lumen? I always refer to the lumen in my videos. It's the hollow interior of a tube. So I've got the lumen here. Here we have our enterocytes, cells of the gut. Now, if we look at the small intestines, it's got three components, the duodenum, which is the first part, the jejunum, the second part, and the ileum. So I'm pretending that we're looking at an enterocyte from each aspect of the small intestines. And then we've got our bloodstream right here. So we can write blood. We've got our bloodstream right here. So we need to talk about absorption. So when we ingest calcium, right? I will do it in blue. When we ingest calcium, what happens? Well, a couple of things. First thing is that, that calcium, as it travels through the lumen, most of it gets absorbed, not at the duodenum, but at the jejunum and ileum. And the way it gets absorbed is it squeezes its way between the cells. Squeezes its way between the cells. How simple is that? This is called passive diffusion. Passive diffusion. And it's through a paracellular route, meaning next to or between the cells. So this is called, actually I'll write it up here so you can see it. This is called a paracellular route. This is the way it's taking. Now, how does it move through? If it's passive diffusion, it will do this when it goes from a high concentration gradient to a low. So if you ingest a lot of calcium and your blood has lower calcium, this is how it moves through. This is going to be the majority, right? This is going to be around about 80% of our calcium gets absorbed this way. However, there's another way that calcium can get absorbed. It is mostly occurring in the duodenal cells, so the first part of the small intestines. What happens is this, really interesting. Let's draw up a nucleus, right? And we know within the nucleus we've got DNA. And those, that DNA has segments, discrete segments that can be translated into proteins that we call genes. Now, there is an important hormone called vitamin D. So when vitamin D is produced, the active form of vitamin D, which is called calcitriol, it's also got another name, which is called, and it's a wonderful name, 1,25-dihydroxy vitamin D, right? So vitamin D, the active form, calcitriol, or 1,25-dihydroxy vitamin D, what it does, it's a fat-soluble vitamin, it can jump in to the nucleus of our cells, and it starts to transcribe and translate mRNA. Well, not trans, well, it transcribes mRNA. That mRNA jumps out, and ribosomes will turn it into proteins. Now, what's it gonna do? Couple of things. First thing is these genes create transporters. They create transporters for calcium. It puts these transporters in, calcium transporters. So this calcium now can enter the duodenal enterocyte. How good is that? So now calcium goes in. Next thing that it does is it creates something called calbindin. Hmm, I wonder what calbindin does. Does it bind calcium? Yes, it does. So what calbindin does, let's say it looks like this right? The calcium will be bound to calbindin that has been produced. Now, what does this, why do we need calcium to be bound to calbindin? Well, let's have a think. If we're increasing the amount of calcium coming into this cell, it's going to make the inside highly concentrated with calcium and very positively charged. Think about that. 
If we're moving calcium in down a concentration gradient and an electrical gradient, if it's so concentrated with calcium or so positively charged, that calcium isn't want to come, doesn't want to come in. So calbindin binds to it to create a pool of calcium that is virtually electro and chemically invisible to this calcium coming in. So it allows for that calcium to continue to enter the enterocyte. Then, so that's two things that the vitamin D has done, transcribed and translated transporters. Transporters to get it in. Calbindin to bind to it. And then what it also does is it helps to create other transporters such as there's a sodium, one that takes three sodium and throws it into the cell, and one that takes the calcium and throws the calcium into the blood. What happens to that calbindin? It will float off. It also, so that's another thing that the mRNA does, is it increases the proteins that comprise of these transporters to be made. There's also another transporter here that it creates, which uses ATP, and it helps to take the calcium and throw it out using ATP. So as you can see, what it does is it, and I'm making it a little bit messy here, is that vitamin D does three things in the enterocyte. Increases, we should, might as well write it, increases, transporters into the cell, increases transporters out of the cell, and also increases calbindin. All of these things, this is an important point, all of these things increase the amount of calcium in our blood, which means one of the roles of vitamin D is to increase blood calcium levels. Perfect, perfect. Now I've got calcium in our blood. What happens to the calcium that's in our blood? Let's take a look.